Income tax 2023-2024. Child and dependent care expenses credit. How to figure the credit part number one. Get ready and some coffee so we can do some tax interpretation with some income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 503 Child and Dependent Care Expenses Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live, noting that the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but it's only half the battle, half the formula. We still have the second half, starting with the calculation of the tax on the taxable income. A little bit more difficult than just simply having a flat tax, however, because we have a progressive tax system. Not only that, but we have some types of income subject to tax rates other than ordinary income tax rates, like, for example, qualified dividends, possibly long-term capital gains. That takes us to the tax before credits and other taxes, basically the tax liability, that line indicating that we have to then account for the tax credits and other taxes. Other taxes, including things other than the federal income tax, might include self-employment tax for sole proprietor proprietorship Schedule C reporters, for example, and then the credits, our point of focus here. Whether the credits be up here or down here in this category, credits are similar to deductions in that they both are basically good for taxes, but a dollar deduction will simply decrease the taxable income, the benefit then being dependent on the tax rate and brackets that we are in, whereas a dollar credit should give us the full dollar benefit unless, for example, we don't have enough tax liability to consume that dollar benefit, which brings us to the difference between these types of credits, which are non-refundable credits, not bringing the tax below zero typically, because if it did, it would no longer be a tax, but rather a welfare benefit safety net program, whereas these credits down here aligned or in the same category as the payments can bring the liability below zero, therefore is acting not as a tax, but rather as a welfare benefit uh, type of program. So then, of course, once we have the tax, we then uh, compare it to the payments and the refundable credits that we have withheld on the payments or estimated payments to get the tax refund or due. So this is going to be the child and dependent care expenses that we're focused on, Form 2441. And this then is the Schedule 3 that it would roll into the additional credits and payments. Part number one, these are the non-refundable credits, the ones that don't take the tax liability below zero. Credit for child and dependent care expenses for Form 2441, Line 11. And then this is the Form 1040 and page number two of it, we're focused on the taxes and credits, looking at the credits in particular, those credits that are non-refundable up here rather than down here in the payments section amounts from schedule three. Now remember that when we think about children, there's multiple tax benefits that you might have on the tax return. First thing we typically look at is possibly, are they a dependent or not? And if they are de a dependent, we're gonna ask, are they a qualifying child? If they're a qualifying child, 
you might get a child tax credit. So that's the first credit that usually comes to mind. That's not what we're focused on here. We're focused on the child and dependent care expenses uh, credit. And then, of course, the child could possibly change people's filing status from if single to possibly head of household. That would take one dependent uh, that could uh, change that filing status. And the child could have an impact on lower income taxpayer for the earned income tax credit, which we've talked about in prior presentations. Once again, remembering that the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, the additional child tax credit has a basically refundable component to it. Whereas when we're looking at the child and dependent care expenses, we're basically looking up here at the non-refundable components. And these credits are going to be based on expenses that we have. The general idea basically being that we had to expend the money to take care of the child so that we could uh, work and uh, generate revenue. That's the idea or justification behind the credit. We went into a bunch of different scenarios which get quite complex depending on whether or not we have an outside provider or we're having someone that we're hiring in our home and different scenarios in terms of what that person is doing or what the institution is doing and so on and so forth. Now we want to get down to how to figure the credit. Let's get down to the actual calculations here. So your credit is a percentage of your work related expenses. So your expenses are subject to the earned income limit and the dollar limit. So we're going to basically have to say, okay, this is going to be the qualified amounts for the credit that we are paying. And then we'll have to think about what kind of limits we might have in terms of the cap that we can be claiming. So the percentage is based on your adjusted gross income. So this credit possibly is not designed so much for just low income individuals like a welfare or social security or like a benefit program, a safety net program, as is the case for an earned income credit. However, there is a cap in terms of as income keeps on going up, you would think that possibly there, there's not as much need for higher income individuals to need this particular credit. And therefore, like many credits and deductions, there's a phase out based on income. Instead of top line income, it's usually the adjusted gross income. That's the typical phase out calculation number. So figuring total work related expenses to figure the credit for 2023 work related expenses, count only those paid by December 31st, 2023. So this is a cash versus accrual kind of concept here in that we're thinking about the payments that happen that actually happened in the current uh, year. So in other words, on an accrual basis, you might be saying, well, maybe I should be thinking about the expenses that were in, that were incurred in this year, even if I paid them like in the following year. But the easier thing to do is to track on a cash based system. However, note that a cash based system can also be subject to manipulation because you might say, hey, look, I'm going to prepay all of my expenses now for future work. That's probably not something the IRS would would look favorably on. Uh, they're going to the, tax, the cash based method because it's generally easier. And then usually if you try to prepay, they're going to say, no, we don't we don't accept that as as a as a as a deduction because uh, the work they'll go to an accrual basis in essence in that case. So expenses prepaid in an earlier year. So if you pay for services before they are provided, you can count the prepaid expenses only in the year the care is received. So that's the general idea. So the general idea is if you're paying like a month to month kind of system, you would think that you'd be you'd be basically on a cash based system and recording the information in the current year. But if, for example, you're like, oh, what I'm going to do is because I think this year I'm going to have a better tax, I have more revenue, so I want to increase my deductions and credits this year. So I'll prepay my babysitter for all of next year or my care provider all of next year in this year. And because I'm on a cash based system, I can deduct it now. The IRS is going to say, well, no, in that case, we want you to go to basically an accrual system and deduct it when the actual work was done because the, the idea is you're abusing the cash-based system. Claim the expenses for the later year as if they were actually paid in that later year. That's also going to cause you an accounting problem now because typically uh, we're usually going to be tracking the expenses by when we paid it is the easiest thing to do. If we pull the reports from QuickBooks or something like that, they usually come through the bank feeds when we, when we pay it. And if we prepay for something and the tax code says we don't want you to deduct it in the year paid, but in a following year, 
then it's going to kind of mess up your whole uh, bookkeeping kind of system to figure out what is actually owed. So just a note on the bookkeeping side, you want to keep it as easy as possible, of course. So expenses not paid until the following year. So don't count 2022 expenses that you paid in 2023 as work-related expenses for 2023. You may be able to claim an additional credit for them on your 2023 return, but uh, you must figure it separately. See payments for prior year expenses under amount of credit later. So now we have an, another kind of cutoff issue, right? That the work was done in a different a different year than the than the payment was weighed. So once again, don't count 2022 expenses that you paid in 2023. So so typically you would think that last month of payment, right in, the, in, in December, they might have worked and then you didn't pay them until 2023. Well, on a cash-based system, you would think you'd get the deduction in 2023, although that's still a little bit confusing given the fact that, that in 2023, that's not when the actual uh, work was done. Obviously, this becomes more substantial if if you paid them rather than week by week or month by month, like a whole year in advance or something like that. So you may be able to claim the additional credit for them on 2023 return. And that's what you would expect to happen, like on a cash based system. But you must figure it separately. OK, tip. So if you had expenses in 2023 that you didn't pay until 2024, you can't count them when figuring your 2023 credit, you may be able to claim a credit for them on your 2024 return. So expenses reimbursed. So we have a reimbursement situation. If your employer reimburses your employment related expenses under a dependent care assistance program, you can't count the expenses that are reimbursed as work related expenses. So in that case, you're getting like a benefit from the employer they're reimbursing you for those expenses so you already got a benefit now this gets a little bit complicated in terms of the relationship between the employer and the employee right because if i'm an if i'm an employee the employer wants to pay me as much as possible that they can which is not subject to federal income taxes by me or social security and medicare by me or them if possible because that means in essence they're paying me more so certain benefit programs might help to do that and if they can reimburse like childcare expenses which is basically income to me but they don't have to include it in line one or box one of the w-2 form and therefore it's not included in income and therefore i'm not paying federal income taxes on it that could be beneficial but you end up with this kind of question of well i can't double dip if i wasn't including it in the federal income taxes i don't get a credit for it so basically if you took it out of line one of my or box one of my w-2 you've given me kind of equivalent to a deduction versus what I would have here for a credit. And it's kind of a complicated calculation as to whether or not which would be better if I was able to take the credit, if I had to include it in income, and then I did this credit calculation, or if I got to deduct it, taking it out of basically line one or box one of the W-2 so it never gets included in income. So if a state or social or, or uh, social services agency pays you a non-taxable amount to reimburse you for your child and dependent care expenses you can't count the expenses that are reimbursed as work-related expenses because of course you got reimbursed example you paid work-related expenses of three thousand dollars you are reimbursed two thousand by a state social services agency you can only use one thousand dollars to figure your credit so that makes sense so medical expenses some expenses for the care of qualifying persons who aren't able to care for themselves may uh, qualify as work-related expenses and also medical expenses so here's where we get in these messy situations because remember with the with the federal income tax system we're taxing people as they earn income the natural kind of deduction that we would expect in that kind of system are those things that you needed to consume to generate revenue because it wouldn't make sense if i had to spend a hundred dollars in order to make a thousand dollars you would you would think i'd get to deduct the hundred dollars because i needed to do that to make the thousand dollars but most of the credits that we looked at and a lot of stuff that's on the schedule a is actually weird meaning it deviates from what you would expect to be a deductible item to all these other things where the government's trying to nudge us or help us or basically playing politics and whatnot and that leads to various issues 
where we might have something that could be deductible in two places. And usually the idea would be, well, you can't normally double dip. You can't deduct it in both places oftentimes. So sometimes that leads to us having to choose where would be the best place to, to take this particular uh, deduction or credit. So can, you can use them either way, but you can't use the same expense to claim both a credit and medical expense deduction. So oftentimes the medical expenses are on Schedule A. Uh, that's one place that you might be able to be subject to a medical expense deduction. But the Schedule A deductions are highly limited because one, you would need to have itemized deductions that are greater than the standard deductions. And two, there's a floor even then on the medical expenses that you would need to clear before you get a benefit from them. So oftentimes, if you have the choice, it might be more beneficial to get to calculate the credit, but it kind of depends on your income level and whether you have itemized deductions and whether the medical expenses are already deductible because you have other things that are adding to it or and so on. So if you use these expenses to figure the credit and they are more than the earned income limit or the dollar limit uh, discussed later, you can add the excess to your medical expenses. So in other words, now you're saying, okay, they would have qualified for both the medical expenses and this credit. Uh, so I'm going to take the credit first because that's possibly more beneficial, but there's an earned, in there's a limit on the amount that I can apply to the credit. So then you might be able to, to apply the amount up to the credit up to that point. And then if there's any excess that was paid above that, possibly apply that to the deduction possibly on the Schedule A medical expenses. However, if you use your total expenses to figure your medical expenses deduction, you can't use any part of them to figure your credit. For information on medical expenses, you can see publication 502 medical and dental expenses caution. Amounts excluded from your income under your employer's dependent care benefit plan can't be used to claim a medical expense deduction. So similar kind of thing happens here. If you're an employee, then oftentimes the employer might be able to give you a benefit through, through some kind of benefit program. And the way they do that is to give you a tax benefit that's reflected basically on the W-2, which means if they've already basically given you the deduction by rather than putting the deduction on 1040, reducing box one of the form 1040, then you've already lowered your income and you can't double dip again, it would be the general idea by also taking the deduction when you already got your income lowered because your employer decreased the amount in box one of the W-2, which decreases your income for federal income tax purposes. So even though you actually got the benefit. So dependent care benefits. If you receive dependent care benefits, your dollar limit for purposes of the credit may be reduced. See reduced dollar limit later. But even if you can't take the credit, you may be able to take an exclusion or deduction for the dependent care benefits. Dependent care benefits. Dependent care benefits include amounts your employer paid directly to either you or your care provider for the care of your qualifying person while you work. So you're going to, to work and the, the employer is saying as part of the benefit program, we're going to basically help you out with the dependent care type of situation. So how is that going to look? You got to think about what the structure of that's going to be. They could either pay you for the money that you then are going to be paying to the care provider or they can pay the pair pro care provider directly either way it's a benefit it's kind of, you would think it would be basically income to you and then the question is would it be a taxable component of income how's it going to be reflected on the w-2 so the fair market value of care in a daycare facility provided or sponsored by you uh you or your employer and the pre-tax contributions you made under a dependent care flexible spending arrangement. All right, your salary may have been reduced to pay for these benefits, meaning they, they re you might have got the benefit, meaning and whenever we talk about salary, it gets a little bit confusing because the, idea, the fact that they reduced the, the wages in box one of the W-2 doesn't mean they reduced the benefit. The idea is that you got paid, but it's not being included in box one of the W-2, which is good. It's kind of like you got a deduction, which is already reflected in the income box so that you don't have to pay taxes on it. 
So if you receive dependent care benefits as an employee, they should be shown in box 10 of your form W-2 wage and tax statement. So in other words, your box one, box five, box three and box five are all income calculations, ones for federal income tax, ones for, for the social security, ones for Medicare. If those numbers are not the same, it's probably because you have some other kind of deduction the most classic one is a 401k plan or some kind of pension plan, but you also might have uh, something like this. And usually that's gonna be like in box 10 where it'll show you kind of the difference. And that's how you can kind of see, okay, this is what I actually got paid in benefits. Usually the Medicare income is the highest income and that's closest to your highest actual salary. Box one just reflects the amount of income that is subject to federal income taxes. So C statement for employer later benefits you receive as a partner should be shown in box 13 of your schedule K-1 form 1040. So if you have a partnership uh, structure, then you're gonna have a K-1 that's gonna flow through to your, your 1040. So enter the amount of these benefits on form 2441 part three line 12, exclusion or deduction. If your employer provides dependent care benefits under a qualified plan, you may be able to exclude these benefits from your income, meaning you got the benefit, but not taxable for federal income tax pur purposes. The employer doing the work by making the adjustment on the form W-2 so that it's easy for you to basically do the taxes by just putting in the W-2. But then you have to remember that you can't double dip because you already got a benefit from it which was done by your employer. Your employer can tell you whether your benefit plan qualifies. To claim an exclusion, you must complete part three of form 2441. So if you are self-employed and receive benefits from a qualified dependent care benefit plan, you are treated as both employer and employee. Therefore, uh, you wouldn't get an exclusion from wages. Instead, you would get a deduction on Schedule C, Form 1040, Line 14, Schedule E, that's you know for rental property, Form 1040, Line 19 or 28, uh, or Schedule F for form, form 1040, Line 15, to claim a deduction, you must use Form 2441. The amount you can exclude or deduct is limited to the smaller of the total amount of dependent care benefits you received during the year, the total amount of qualified expenses you incurred during the year, uh, your earned income, your spouse's earned income, or the maximum amount allowed under the dependent care plan for 2023, the maximum amount that can be excluded from an employee's income through a dependent care assistance program is $5,000, $2,500 uh, if married filing separately. So the definition of earned income for the exclusion or deduction is the same as the definition used when figuring the credit, except that earned income for the exclusion or deduction doesn't include any dependent care benefits you receive. Tip, you can elect to include uh, your non-taxable combat pay. So once again, we have this combat pay situation we've seen in prior presentations with the earned income tax credit as well. Uh, to figure your exclusion or deduction, even if you elect not to include it in earned income for the earned income credit or the credit for child and dependent care expenses. So combat pay, you'll recall, they're trying to give a benefit by not having it be taxable, but by not having it be taxable, it's often not in earned income, which can mess people up and actually decrease their tax benefits if they were subject to earned income tax credit or some of these other credits. And therefore you might be able to be doing some flexible adding of the combat pay to calculate the credits, which could actually actually benefit you from a tax standpoint, even though you're increasing income for the calculation of those particular credits. All right, statement for employee. So your employer must give you a form W-2 or similar statement showing in box 10, the total amount of dependent care benefits provided to you during the year under the qualified plan. So, you're, so then you can kind of look at like box one versus box five, your federal gross wages versus your Medicare gross, gross wages, for example, and try to see, and then compare that to box 10 and try to see what the difference is and whether or not basically you've already got kind of a benefit from it by reducing box one, which will reduce your income for federal income tax purposes.
basically giving you a deduction that's already been put in place before you record the income line into the into the tax return. So your employer will also include in your wages shown in box one of uh, your form W-2 any dependent care benefits that exceed the maximum amount of dependent care benefits allowed to be excluded. The maximum amount is $5,000, $2,500 if married filing separately. Effect of exclusion on credit. So if you exclude dependent care benefits from your income, the amount of the excluded benefits isn't included in your work-related expenses and reduces the dollar limit discussed later. So you've got earned income limit plus the amount of work of work minus the related expenses you use to figure your credit can't be more than your earned income for the year if you are single at the end of the year or the smaller of your or your spouse's earned income for the year if you are married at the end of the year. Let's look at an example. This is getting complex for crying out loud. So you remarried on December 3rd. I remarried. I never. I didn't know I was married before. Okay, remarried on December third. Your earned income for the year was eighteen thousand dollars. Your new spouse's earned income for the year was two thousand dollars. All right. You paid work-related expenses of three thousand dollars for the care of your five-year-old child and quali and qualified to claim the credit. I hope that depend that care provider we hired can handle that kid. She's crazy. It's gonna be like Mary Poppins is just going through care providers like crazy. So the amount of expenses you use to figure your credit can't be more than $2,000, the smaller of your earned income and that of your spouse. So once again, we got married, your earned income for the year, mine was 18,000, but the new spouse's earned income was 2,000. Why would that be a limit, the spouse's income? Because they're trying to basically say that, that that there has to be an, in, an earned income of the spouse because the benefit of the provider that we have is so that you can generate revenue and and you would think that so so they're limiting they're limiting the amount of credit you could take based on the earned income of you and your spouse now note this is important also with the tax data input into a software system because you have to make sure that you allocate properly the two w-2s to the to one taxpayer and the spouse because if you don't, then the tax would normally be the same because they're like one taxable entity, but you run into some of these weird situations for some of the credits where they actually need to see the income broken out by spouse so they can apply some of these, some of these uh, limitations. Uh, separated spouse. So if you are legally separated or married and living apart from your spouse as described under what's your filing status earlier, you aren't considered married for purposes of the earned income limit. So use only your income in figuring the earned income limit in that case. Surviving spouse, if your spouse died during the year and you file a joint return as a surviving spouse, you may but aren't required to take into account the earned income of your spouse who died during the year. So community property laws. So uh, uh, disregard community property laws when you figure earned income for this credit. So sometimes when we deal with these situations where we have the two spouses and whatnot, d it differs by state because some states are, have community property laws that are different than other states, which leads to complications. But they're saying disregard the community property laws when you figure the earned income for the credit. Community property laws are explained in publication 555.